All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Trinity Tran with the California Public Banking Alliance, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible work of the volunteer activists of the public banking movement. When we set out on this mission over three years ago, we envisioned a network of public banks in California deeply rooted in our communities that would use public funds the way they should be used, not for private gain, but to address the needs of the people, to fund sustainable projects, and reinvest wealth back into our streets. We took this vision, we built a movement, and in one legislative session, we turned a policy into a law. And now from the state level to the city level, Alliance activists and legislators are working together to move motions and, and resolutions forward up and down the state. So this is an incredible moment to see our vision uh, come alive. The elected officials in this town hall represent some of the largest economic power centers in the in the nation. Cities that are are taking concrete steps to create responsible and accountable public banks, and it takes real leadership to to trailblaze and design a new institution that will one day uh, transform the social and economic landscape of this country. So we commend the speakers here today for helping to lead the way. This is a defining moment, not uh, for public banking. This is a defining moment for public banking and for the future and the evolution of finance. So a better world is not only possible, it's unfolding uh, as we work to, to build a new community-led and human-centered system. So I thank all of you for joining us and supporting our work. Uh, for those who are new, welcome to the movement. And with that, I'll hand it over to David Cobb, a, a true champion of the people and our mm -hmm. for the evening. Thank you. We the people, those three, those three words are hallowed in this country. They're the first three words of our constitution, literally the supreme law of the land. They remind us, in fact, they ground us in the acknowledgement that we are a self-governing people and that our democratic republic means that we the people are sovereign. We the people are supposed to be ruling ourselves. But in a democratic republic, that only works if elected officials consider themselves truly to be servants of the people and are committed to that democratic process. Uh, today, you're going to hear from six true champions. They're elected officials, but they're elected officials that are really cut from a different cloth because we all know that there are far too many people who are becoming genuinely apathetic, cynical, to the great experiment of democracy. Uh, we believe that public banking is not only a great <clears throat> policy, and it is a great policy, but deeper still, it is a way to democratize finance. It's a way to allow we the people to help to control and shape not only individual policies, but where our money goes. Uh, and so it's important to understand that when we talk about public banking, it begs the question, well, what is a public bank? And not to be too flip, but the difference between a public bank and a private bank is a public bank is owned and operated in the interest of the public. Private banks, which are virtually every bank in this country, save one, are literally owned and operated at the interest and to benefit the shareholders of that institution. So a public bank, as Trinity said, really is a way to democratize finance. Uh, and it's important to recognize that here in California, it was a true partnership with a broad and deep public movement uh, of grassroots activists with champions in the state legislature uh, who, got that bill passed to allow not one, but up to 10 local or regional public banks. Uh, we are working diligently with the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation to promulgate the rules associated with the, what those public banks will look like. In addition, I wanna point out that we have helped to spark and be a catalyst for a national movement that is really moving. The Philadelphia City Council recently took steps towards creating a public bank and passed legislation to establish the 
Philadelphia Public Financial Authority. But wait, there's more. New York organizers are actively working to pass legislation to establish the New York Public Banking Act, modeled directly on California's Public Banking Act. In Massachusetts, they're making moves towards a public bank. The bill is currently active in the st state legislature with very strong local support. New Jersey is moving forward with the state public bank and have their public hearing scheduled next month in April. Colorado has legislation that's introduced that will authorize local subdivisions to create public banks. And in New Mexico, advocates are full steam ahead in 2023 to establish a state public bank. What we're going to do today is here in five minutes, remarks from these true champions uh, of public banking here in California. Then we'll hear from Eric Hardemeyer, who is the former CEO of the Public Bank of North Dakota. Then we'll open it up for questions and comments to you. Uh, <laughs> please use the chat format because we have over 140 people participating live in the webinar. Hundreds are watching on Facebook and we know that thousands will watch this recording. So please make judicious use of the chat, uh, ask your questions. We will give both the all of the panelists and then Eric an opportunity to circle back. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce Assembly Member Miguel Santiago. Uh, Assembly Member Santiago represents California's 53rd Assembly District, which includes downtown Los Angeles. In the legislature, he has fought to eradicate homelessness, led the effort for free community college, authored California's public banking bills. He's a true champion of the people. He currently serves as chair of the Government Organization Committee and sits on the Health, Higher Education, Public Safety, and Utilities and Energy Committee. Assembly Member Santiago, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Brother David. And uh, I want to say thanks to everybody who's on here uh, taking your evening to help build the movement. Um, it's quite remarkable because I, I have to say that justice work is not easy. Uh, it, it, it takes real leadership and, and a grassroots movement. And that's exactly what really helped uh, to propel uh, this conversation about public banks and state legislature. Uh, but I want to take, take a moment and, and I'm going to break a rule that elected officials should probably not break which is when you think one person, you, you should really list all those people that you wanna thank. But that list is so long, so I uh, wanna thank uh, Trinity Tran. Um, I've, in my lifetime, seen a few people with the leadership skills that she has, uh, the, just the heart and the desire to do good for everyone. Um, and she was a force to be reckoned with when we did uh, the public banks bill here in the state of California. So let me let's get into that. And it's, uh, and and uh, I want to recognize all the rest of the speakers. Some of our colleagues have really uh, stepped up to make this a reality. The first bill we did here in the state of California uh, was AB eight five seven. That was uh, myself uh, and Mr. Uh, Chu, who's now the city attorney in the city of San Francisco. Now, folks <laughs> thought we were crazy. What is this concept? What the 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 old system's working really well? <laughs> you know, it's it's taking care of people. We argue differently. The current system is not working. Uh, it is prioritizing profits over people, and we think a different kind of banking system should be built. Now, we look all over the country. Not a single public bank's bill has been successful to get to the governor's desk. But we thought this would be a long-term fight. Well, let me tell you what happened. We engage with, with the uh, Public Banking Alliance here in the state of California, the good people in San Francisco, the good people in LA, and all across the state. I don't mean to leave anybody out. And I, this was one of the first times, the only time in the legislature, where you had a high-profile bill like this taking on entire Wall Street and entire, an entire uh, army uh, of lobbyists who didn't think we would move ahead and didn't think we could get this done. Well, I'll tell you the kind of push we had. We had national movement from, from everyone in California. We had hundreds of grassroots organizations. The California Democratic Party push, uh, county central committees uh, push across the state. We had uh, Senator Bernie Sanders tweet about it. We had our national revolution. We had uh, AOC at, 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 uh, tweet towards the end of, of the process, which helped to propel this movement. There was a national movement to get this bill across the finish line. 
And today now we have uh, the ability to create 10 public municipal banks up and down the state. At, and, and, and that's a pretty good uh, success story about what happens when you have grassroots leadership, when you create a movement uh, that was able to steamroll an army, a high paid lobbyist in the state of California. Um, so I wanna thank everybody who's on here and just give you an idea of how hard uh, you fought and the kind of movement you created across the country. Uh, and, then, and then we doubled down, we came back next year with the same coalition. Uh, and now we had uh, labor coalitions like SEIU, uh, the Federation of Labor up and down the state helping us to push for now what we did was AB 1177. Again, Mr. Chu and others joined, and we created a statewide uh, uh, public banking option that would allow individuals, in this case, to do get retail services to go to a bank, but it would be free, no fees, uh, and it would serve to bank those who are unbanked uh, or less banked in the state of California. Imagine that, a bank that isn't trying to create a profit a bank that, is serve, that serves the people, that is not gonna nickel and dime you for a fee, an overdraft fee here, uh, minimum balance here, uh, this and that and that, when people are already struggling. And, and they argued and they fought and they doubled down uh, on, them, on the efforts to, to take this initiative down. And we were successful because we had that grassroots coalition. We had leadership like all of you who are on today and, and, and folks who, who really fought hard. So I'm extremely excited. And I will tell you again, this is a testament of a people power movement to get things done in the face of heavy, heavy and entrenched interest. So we're extremely excited uh, about the work that's now gonna happen in creating uh, the statewide public banking option uh, for people and the work that's gonna happen at local municipalities. Uh, like my two colleagues are gonna speak a little bit later, uh, Mr. Garcia, the mayor of Long Beach and uh, uh, Mr. Price, who's a council member, just right south of me, um, to create that and to make it a reality. And I want to thank them personally for stepping up from the very beginning uh, and having the courage uh, to say, yes, I'll support, I'll work, and I'll make this thing happen. So thank you very much for everybody who's on here today. A big round of applause for everybody who's on here and the hard work and dedication that you're having to lead in a, in, with the progressive values and get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member Santiago. Powerful words. Um, our next speaker is Los Angeles City Council Member Curran Price. Uh, Council Member Price's work focuses on economic growth, affordable housing, reducing homelessness, and, immig and immigrant rights. He initiated a guaranteed basic income pilot program in Los Angeles and led the passage of the Los Angeles Public Bank motion. Council Member Price, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks to you, Trinity, uh, and the, the combined team for, for making this town hall possible and for your extraordinary work uh, over the past uh, several years. Let, let me just thank the Public Bank LA and the California Public Banking Alliance for inviting me to participate in this town hall tonight. Special shout out to, to my elected colleagues, uh, Assembly uh, member Miguel Santiago from the 53rd district whom you recently heard from has been a real pioneer, real leader, real source of inspiration for us here in California. Uh, and he has singularly uh, provided uh, extraordinary direction uh, and um, assistance at the state level. And so we appreciate him for that. Uh, Long Beach Mayor Robert Garcia uh, has been uh, another strong opponent and other elected officials from Northern California. Uh, I'll thank you all for participating in tonight's town hall to really help grow this movement uh, in ways that we have not seen before. You know, the idea of public banking is not new in Los Angeles. In fact, it was introduced in 2017 when the council voted to explore the creation of a Los Angeles public bank. Uh, you know, and that, uh, that vote was taken with a lot of uh, assistance, uh, a lot of advocacy, from many uh, on this call, and so and we appreciate that. Of course, thanks to Assemblymember Santiago, the passage of AB 857 in 2019 allowed us, in the city of Los Angeles and other cities in California to move forward with the establishment of public banks. And let me tell you, that uh, authorization was significant. It was hard fought, uh, it was significant, uh, and it made an important 
contribution in this discussion, not just here in California, but really, but throughout the country. Last year, as chair of the, last year as chair of the council's economic development and jobs committee, I hosted a hearing that resulted in the city council authorizing the chief legislative analyst to release an RFP to hire a consultant that will provide a framework for creating a public bank right here in Los Angeles. Uh, that RFP is gonna be released next month. Uh, and I look forward to reviewing their findings with you to determining our next steps. Personally, I see public bank is being utilized by the city to fill the role that traditional banking institutions do not. You know, I think uh, David and Trinity certainly referenced that very eloquently earlier. For example, uh, we saw firsthand during the pandemic, the incredible need there was to assist small businesses. You know, here in our city, we distributed over $120 million in small business grants. Uh, and for over a decade, we provided low interest loans to small businesses, minority businesses, women owned businesses. So I see the public bank enhancing and expanding uh, on this type of work, especially at a time when assistance is so sorely needed. For years, the city has also offered first time home buyer assistance. And again, I believe that if we had a public bank, we could quadruple the number of families that we help to become homeowners on an annual basis. Uh, and finally, we could provide home, additional home ownership workshops uh, and financial literacy courses to help Angelinos pursue the dream of buying a home. You know, it takes uh, uh, many efforts, uh, many skills, uh, and, and assistance to really make that possible. In addition, I think we can utilize a public bank to address our housing crisis. Uh, we could build more affordable housing, more permanent supportive housing, uh, provide assistance of property owners uh, interested in doing uh, auxiliary dwelling unit conversions, all of which could help significantly increase the housing stock uh, that we so desperately need not just here in LA, not just in our state, but really, but around this country. And lastly, I think a public bank can offer an opportunity to invest in more renewable energy solutions to help our city, for example, meet its goal of relying solely on clean energy by 2035. That's not too far from now. This could be done by providing financial resources to retrofit buildings to be solar powered, installing community charging stations for electric vehicles, and providing incentives to solar, pa uh, solar panels, in incentives to install solar panels at home on homes and at businesses. These are just a few of the ideas, but I think we all agree the opportunities are endless. So I look forward to the conversation tonight and learning from you all about how we best move forward on this subject of public banking. Again, I, I thank you for participating. Uh, giving me the chance to participate, to join with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Council Member Price. Our next speaker is Long Beach Mayor Robert Garcia. Mayor Garcia has served as mayor of Long Beach for the last seven years and has earned a well-deserved reputation for progressive action around climate change and launching a guaranteed income program. Mayor Gar Garcia believes that public banking is the next municipal, state, and federal issue that we must collectively promote and tackle together. Mayor Garcia. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me today. I, I appreciate this. Uh, great opportunity to, to talk to so many folks that are um, supportive of, I think, what many of us believe uh, is truly one of the most kind of positive, progressive policy developments that we can all focus on. Uh, over the next few decades. Um, I, when we talk about public banks, I always share with people, you know, we have public libraries, we have public transit, uh, we have public housing. Uh, public banks is absolutely possible, and it's something that all of us can focus on in the future. Um, in Long Beach, we've done a great job, I think, of really focusing through the legislation, and I want to thank uh, Assemblymember Santiago for truly being a leader uh, statewide uh, on the issue. Um, I think that more than importantly than anything, it's up to cities right now to make sure that we focus on getting uh, our public banks in place. We hired in the city of Long Beach an, uh, an equity officer whose job it is to work on our public banking process. We've gone through an incredible needs assessment process. We have a, we have a public banking work group that's working on the issue in the city. 
Uh, and what we're trying to do is focus already on the programs that are uh, municipal in nature, like our micro loan program that we have. Uh, we have a, a program for uh, underbanked communities and neighborhoods where we're, we're bringing folks in and out and providing <coughs> resources for them to make in small investments and provide loans and trying to organize it around a new public bank uh, banking system in the city. Uh, we are actively going to be looking to the state uh, towards uh, you know, providing uh, those additional resources and additional help. I think the public banking coalition and all the public banking advocates across the state have been really great um, uh, kind of experts also in, in, in guiding us in the process. We should not expect this is going to be an easy process. Uh, there's going to be bumps in the road. Um, but the, the, the public banking um, advocates and, and, and experts have been really great at helping cities navigate all of this. And I think the, the legislature um, has put us on a really great pathway to getting public banks done. I want Long Beach to be one of the first cities with an active, open, uh, uh, equitable uh, public bank that focuses on justice and access for all. Um, and, and we can do it. And I just want to thank all the activists that are on here um, for giving us an opportunity to share how excited we are about public banks um, and the future of public banking um, as a whole. I also want to say that um, it's important that we uh, succeed in California. I mean, we we know that public public banks have existed. Uh, this is not completely a new concept. But it's important that we that we prove to the country that we can do it in California, and that we can be a model so that people are investing back into their neighborhoods. They're not investing in uh, into these uh, uh, large corporations and large banks and Wall Street and all these investments that aren't really going back into cities and into communities. And so uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, uh, thank you for having me, even though I had a um, stepping away from another event, I did not want to miss this. And I just wanted to thank you all, especially all the activists on the ground for continuing to push on public banks. And, and I'm just really proud that Long Beach uh, took a formal position to support public banks, to start a process, uh, to get our group in order. Uh, and, and we've begun and, and invested the dollars to start our working groups uh, and, our, and our needs assessment in the community. So I'm just very grateful to all of you and thank you so much for, uh, for having me for a few minutes. Thank you, Mayor Garcia. And thank you very much also for taking the time out of another event to come uh, to this town hall. It's greatly appreciated. Our next speaker is Santa Cruz City Council member, Justin Cummings. Dr. Cummings is an environmental scientist with over 20 years of experience working in climate change, environmental conservation, and a myriad of social justice issues. He's the former mayor and a current council member of Santa Cruz. Council Member Cummings. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you all for having me today, having me here today. And I wanna give a special shout out and thanks to the people for public banking who here in the Santa Cruz region have been working with local jurisdictions, not only members of the community, but uh, city leaders and county leaders from Santa Cruz all the way to Santa Barbara to try to make sure that we can make public banking a reality for our, the members of our communities. Um, I have a couple of examples that I'd, I'd like to start with, um, but uh, one in particular is that you know, right now, for example, Santa Cruz is moving forward with a half of 1% sales tax measure that we're putting on our ballot. And if that passes, and, and I don't want to get into the debate over progressive versus regressive sales tax, but that's it. We won't be able to increase our sales tax anymore after that. And people ask, you know, moving forward, what are we going to do to increase revenue for our community? And one of the things that the reason, and one of the reasons why I'm supporting public banking is because this is an opportunity for us to take money that we would normally invest in private banks and create a local bank where we're able to invest our tax dollars into our communities and the interest that we gain on those dollars come back to the support of the communities that we live in. This is a, a very important movement because as we start thinking about how we're investing money, we're making sure that money isn't going into the pockets <clears throat> of wealthy people. It's not going into the pockets of CEOs of private banks. It's going back into the communities where we are, where here in California in particular, we're struggling a lot around a lot of issues. Here in Santa Cruz as well, we have a number of housing programs. And I would, I should point out that back in 2017, a study was done in Santa Cruz City is one of the, is the fourth most expensive place to live in the world when you look at median home price versus median income. And that's an issue because working class families 
can't afford to purchase homes in our community. Working class families can barely afford to rent. And we, everyone across California has experienced the impact of homelessness, uh, which is um, you know, something that we are all trying to figure out how to deal with. And one of the things that we can do by investing in public banks is, is creating an institution where local municipalities can, can have access to loans, where people can have access to um, whether it's small business loans or loans to support affordable housing, but where we can actually start taking our dollars, maximizing their potential and investing back in, uh, into our communities. And uh, that's one of the reasons why since 2019, I've been so supportive of moving forward with public banking. Um, some of the benefits that we can see is that we can use this as an opportunity to invest in our infrastructure. We can use this as an opportunity to invest in affordable housing projects. We can use this as an opportunity to invest in small business owners and entrepreneurs in our community. And it's because of the efforts of many people, um, including Assembly Member Santiago, many activists in our community, that we're able to have this opportunity for us to see a new and different way to be able to move forward and figure out ways that we can actually make our tax dollars and the money, the, the, the money that people invest in their communities grow even further. Um, you know, one of the other examples I'd like to make, and I think it was mentioned earlier, was how, you know, during COVID, many communities had to come up with innovative ways of how we could support small businesses. Here in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, when we found out that our PPP loans were, um, you know, the application process was delayed and there were impacts with that, you know, we came up with an idea of taking money from our economic development trust fund and creating a small business microloan program. Now, right now, the city is the one is the entity that's controlling how that program operates. But this is something that if we had a public bank, the public bank itself could be the institution that manages these kinds of programs. And when we think about, you know, affordable housing and how we can make, um, you know, purchasing affordable housing more accessible to people, a public bank could be an institution that wouldn't be limited in how it could um, provide loans to low-income people. And it wouldn't be restricted by the you know, prospects of maybe this isn't going to be um, a good investment for our shareholders to give these small um, affordable housing loans out. You know, this could be an opportunity for us to move forward and figure out how we can make many of the affordable housing programs that some of our jurisdictions have that have been sitting and haven't been as operational successful moving forward. And so um, I'm really excited to be here to speak with everyone. I'm excited to hear about new ideas and ways that we can move this forward and how we can really make the money of the people support programs that support the people of our communities. And so I wanna thank you all for having me here. I wanna thank you all for being here and all the work that everyone's done to make this a reality. And my hope is that coming out of this, we have marching orders of how we can move forward and make this a reality in our communities. Thank you. And thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, our next speaker is former San Francisco Supervisor John Avalos. Uh, John is now serving as Director of the Council of Community Housing Organizations. As a San Francisco Supervisor, John was an early leader for the creation of a public bank in San Francisco in the fallout of the 2008 global financial crisis. Truly an early adapter. Uh, John? Great, thank you. And thank you everyone for being here tonight and uh, your uh, interest in this movement. Uh, it is uh, a decade in the making, uh, looking at the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, and that was my inspiration uh, years ago, trying to figure out a response to uh, the global crisis that we are in, the global financial crisis, uh, Great Recession. Um, I live in a part of San Francisco that is the southern part um, and southeastern part of San Francisco where there's a lot of labor households, a lot of working class people over the years have been able to actually buy their own homes and sustain those homes. Uh, but the crisis of 2008, 2009 uh, led to a whole slew of foreclosures that had happened. Uh, Wall Street banks had preyed upon our communities uh, with subprime loans. They try and say that those were like predatory loan uh, you know, providers, but it was actually Wells Fargo and Bank of America and major Wall Street banks that were part of the crisis. 
Uh, and uh, of course, they lost a lot of money uh, during the crisis, but they got bailed out. Uh, it was our you know, homeowners and working class people who did not get bailed out. And in San Francisco, if you saw uh, the neighborhoods that were affected by defaults and later foreclosures, uh, you would see, if you had a dot for every home uh, in the southern part of San Francisco, you'd see a whole concentrate or a home where uh, anyone was foreclosed upon in San, in San Francisco, you see the dots concentrate in the southern part of the city. Unfortunately, the city and county of San Francisco did nothing to address that problem. Uh, they wanted to focus on economic development as it already served the more affluent who were actually suffering a little bit more, uh, you know, were suffering as well uh, during the Great Recession, uh, not even caring about uh, the mass mi out migration of Latinx people and African American people who could no longer afford to stay in the city, the breakup of families and the rise of homelessness that, that had happened. Our response in San Francisco uh, was trying to get attention of the city, uh, and it took a movement of people uh, to do that. Uh, where there wasn't recognition of uh, the, the suffering of homeowners who were losing their homes and being evicted. Uh, we started the Occupy. Uh, the Occupy movement came to people's homes, it came to uh, Main Street, came to our everyday avenues and streets uh, in our neighborhoods in San Francisco, uh, where people occupy their own homes to prevent um, uh, the, the foreclosure from happening. We had to go to that level to get the attention of the city. We, uh, my office as the member of the Board of Supervisors had asked the city attorney to look to draft legislation to help us to create a public bank or a pathway towards that. And they told us, actually, you can't do that. Their opinion was that the city and county does not have the, uh, the authority to do that. So when we had our mass movement, the Occupy movement, and the movement in our homes to stop the evictions due to foreclosures. It finally got the attention of the city to change their opinion. We pointed out to the city that, look, the city is already acting in, in a lending capacity uh, to small businesses, to big corporations. Uh, we provide a lot of subsidies to uh, enable uh, market rate development. Uh, why can't we actually do this in a more... Uh, with a governance structure that's it's my, maintained by the people. So with that, uh, we were with the demonstration of the people's desire for a better way of being served by uh, the city's finances, we were able to get that opinion. But then it took a lot to actually realize how we're gonna get to actually capitalize the bank. How do we actually put a governance structure together? How do we actually, what should a governance structure look like? Is there a business plan that could be a model that could be used? And so over the years, the city has passed legislation to make that happen. And finally, we're in a place where the city is looking at deciding what our governance structure is going to be, what our business plan will be for first a municipal finance corporation and then a public bank. But the real question is, is how do we capitalize that? And we know with the city and county, it's $13 billion. You also have $25 billion in the um, and the retirement fund as well. And there's other funds that are available as well. How do you actually pull those all together and have the people who control those purse strings to loosen them up for a more democratized uh, way of actually organizing that money? That's where the movement comes in to demonstrate that the only way we were gonna actually make sure that these institutions are in our hands is that we have, we speak up together to make that happen as we did during the Occupy movement. We can get to the capitalization of the bank through our people's movements. Thank you so much, John. Uh, our last local speaker is Richmond City Council member, Gail McLaughlin, another longtime progressive champion. Uh, Gail McLaughlin has served as the mayor of Richmond in the past and is the founder of the California Progressive Alliance. She is currently shepherding the Public Bank East Bay Viability Study through the approval process in the Richmond City Council. Council Member McLaughlin. Thank you so much, David, and thank you everyone for inviting me to say a few words here in support of public banking. Thank you to the organizers and everyone who has worked on public banking for so long. We are at a crossroads. We are at a, um, a level of moving things in into fruition, into actually creating public banks. Over the course of the Great Recession, while I was mayor, various public banking experts and volunteers talked with me and Richmond City staff about the concept of a public bank for Richmond. 
It was later decided it made more sense to move forward as a regional bank, and the Friends of the Public Bank East Bay was founded in August 2016 to advocate for such a public bank in the East Bay region of the San Francisco Bay Area. In 2019, AB 857 was passed by the California legislature and signed by Governor Newsom. It created a process for cities and counties to set up public banks. Now, I want to share with you some of the reasons why I am so committed to moving this regional public bank forward in the interest of our Richmond community and that of the entire East Bay. Richmond is a working class city with a majority people of color community. We, like many cities throughout the state and region, have many ongoing challenges, including the housing crisis, the economic crisis, climate crisis, struggling small businesses, families in need, and a tight city budget. The public bank will help us enormously. Friends of the Public Bank East Bay's mission is to provide community uh, oversight and stewardship in the formation and functioning of the public bank in the East Bay. They have commissioned a viability study and as stated by the study, the bank's decisions will be based on five key values, equity, social responsibility, fiscal responsibility, accountability, and democracy. The four initial programs will be affordable housing, small business lending, um, climate initiatives, and municipal finance. I envision nonprofit housing developers being able to access low interest loans to build truly affordable housing for our community and small businesses able to stay afloat with low interest loans as well. Another aspect of the mission of the public bank is to provide low cost borrowing options for municipalities whose only option before was to borrow from Wall Street banks, beholden to shareholders to maximize profits with taxpayer money. In the short term, even by refinancing just one relatively small municipal bond of approximately 28 million at a lower rate, 3% that a public bank would, um, would offer versus the 4.73% that is now on the table from private banks, the city of Richmond would be able to save millions. This coming Tuesday, April 5th, I have an item on the Richmond City Council to approve the viability study and authorize Richmond to be a founding member of the bank along with Berkeley and Oakland. Later, Alameda County is expected to join this public bank, and we hope that Contra Costa County will as well. In conclusion, I just want to say a few words about the climate crisis and how our public bank will help our region protect our residents and create green jobs and a sustainable future. Over the past several years, we've seen what looks like an apocalypse as wildfires left California skies blood red and choked by smoke. Entire towns reduced to rubble, nearly all of which were found to be directly due to mismanaged infrastructure by the state's largest energy corporations. Every year we see more carnage and the clock ticking toward more and more of a complete climate catastrophe. The only path forward to save humanity is to face these crises head on and build a new economic foundation capable of overhauling our energy grid to 100% renewable, building sustainable and truly afford housing, good jobs, transit systems, and much more. It is vital that Richmond and our region and regions everywhere are equipped with every tool possible to mobilize the resources needed and a public bank will provide these. The for-profit mega banks have almost completely monopolized public finance and failed miserably to provide the services needed by our communities. We can and must do better. So I'll just end by saying we have a great example of a public bank by the Bank of North Dakota that's operated successfully for 100 years plus. And it's um, my hope and my belief that the public bank East Bay will become another example 
of a successful public bank by putting people and planet first. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Council Member McLaughlin. Uh, and thanks also for beginning the introduction uh, to our last speaker, really our, our keynote speaker, if you will, of this town hall forum. Uh, and that, of course, is Eric Hardemeyer, the former CEO and president of the Bank of North Dakota. It's worth noting he's the longest serving uh, president. and. Eric navigated times of great economic change within North Dakota through oil booms and busts, through drought and natural disasters. And under his leadership, he ensured that the bank remained relevant and played and continues to play a critical role for the residents of North Dakota. Uh, we've already had reference in the chat about the uh, PPP, which I know he's going to touch upon. The last thing I want to say is introduction is that politically, uh, Eric Hardemeyer is respected by both parties and claims allegiance to neither. Uh, Eric, welcome to the conversation. Well, thank you, David. Um, good evening. Uh, nice to be uh, with you tonight. Um, I imagine uh, for many of you, this is the first time you've uh, probably seen and heard from a North Dakotan. So uh, <laughs> it's not often that North Dakota is the first to the starting line on any new initiative. And we do have, of course, the benefit of a 100-year head start. And I, I'm happy to share with you my experiences uh, with you um, for what we like to call uh, the Bank of North Dakota is the bank of good for the state of North Dakota. So I'm going to uh, give you a brief outline of my discussion uh, this evening um, over the next 30 minutes. I understand that afterwards there may be an opportunity for some Q&A. So the, the five areas that I would like to cover, I've been asked to cover. Uh, first, I think it's a little uh, important that I, I give you a little more color on the history of the Bank of North Dakota, why it was started, where it stands today with mission and financial strength. I wanna talk a little bit about how public banks can benefit government. And I, I think it's important for you to realize that when when we talk about the Bank of North Dakota, of course, we are the bank for the state of North Dakota. So we cover every square inch of uh, the state of North Dakota. As you all know, it's it's not a large state. It's a population of 850,000 uh, folks. And, you know, there's two degrees of separation between, uh, you know, all of North Dakota. So uh, we all know each other. We all know the politicians. Um, and that, of course, is one of the reasons why uh, things work as well as they do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the way the bank is structured, a partnership approach rather than a competitor approach with the private sector, why I think that is important and why it is really a hallmark of one of the founding principles of the Bank of North Dakota, which, which I will get into in a bit as well. I'd like to talk about how... Uh, the Bank of North Dakota is organized to solve financial problems. And I, and I would say it isn't just problems that we're looking uh, to do to solve, but, but opportunities. Um, so looking forward, looking ahead, uh, not just looking in the rearview mirror, but what, what's coming in front of us that we need to get out in front of um, and, and be proactive. So that, that's one of our, our uh, mantras at the Bank of North Dakota was to be proactive, not reactive. And you know, if time permits, uh, I would like to answer some frequently asked questions that I get. Every one of the, the states that have been talked about um, in terms of uh, moving forward with public banking, I've talked to. I, I've been to New York several times. I've been to New Jersey. Um, I've talked to virtually every state or state official um, in 30 to 40 states who have uh, brought up this concept. So uh, I'll just tell you that this became, um, you know, part of the national consciousness, this public bank, I would say after 2008. Um, of course, the great recession uh, had everybody looking at the banking sector, wondering what could they possibly be thinking about? They are jeopardizing. Uh, you know, their own institutions, their shareholders, um, and uh, 
course, the state of North Dakota skated by the uh, 2008 uh, Great Recession. And in fact, we flourished. Um, and a, a lot of the credit was given to the Bank of North Dakota. I would argue that that probably not accurate, it's erroneous. We did have, you know, a, a piece in it, certainly, but we were not the primary reason that the state of North Dakota did not go through the recession. Um, we happened to be at the time developing a, a very large energy play um, that, that helped us uh, get beyond all of the issues that you saw. And, and secondly, I would say the, the other reason why we skated by is by our nature, North Dakotans are very um, uh, cautious, conservative. Uh, we at the bank, uh, although we run a, you know, a progressive bank, um, you, you know, believe in the Warren Buffett rule of management is that if we don't understand it, we're not going to do it. So, you know, we didn't step uh, into the large uh, derivative uh, issues that other banks did. We stayed away from private label mortgage-backed securities, um, never wanted to jeopardize taxpayer dollars. So we completely stayed away from those issues uh, that plagued the rest of the country. We had no bank defaults in North Dakota, zero. I think we're one of just a few states that can, that can say that. So, so let me begin a little bit with uh, a little bit of history on, on the bank. Um, and I'll try to be brief, but, um, you know, it would be important for me to tell you that if this initiative were to start in North Dakota today, uh, many of you probably know this, North Dakota is a very red state. Um, and as David said, I am, you know, proud to be a, uh, a get along with both parties, uh, although the Republican Party dominates to a significant degree in the state of North Dakota. Um, but I've always uh, thought of myself as a centrist, uh, you know, able to work with, with both sides. Um, so our, our history goes back 102 years ago, uh, right after uh, the First World War, uh, right after, of course, the, the Spanish flu. Um, and there was a, a, a very angry agrarian movement, a revolt, um, if you will, by North Dakota farmers, led by a very charismatic socialist by the name of A.C. Townley, uh, who took it upon himself to rally, you know, the the, the troops. And and uh, at the time, they were the the farming community was upset with. Uh, what they felt were all of the, the decisions were out of our hands by out of state interest, including commodity prices, um, opportunities for financing, high interest rates. So everything was controlled by the big money center banks in New York, Chicago, uh, uh, Minneapolis. Of course, all the big uh, millers and elevators were in Minneapolis, all taking advantage of North Dakotan farmers. Um, and so this, this uh, very charismatic man um, rallied the troops, created a, a new party, a new uh, um, party in the state of North Dakota called the Nonpartisan League, took control of the legislature, was called the Industrial Program, which solved you know, all of the issues the farmers had. They created the state mill and elevator, which is still running today and is the largest mill and elevator in the country. Um, they also at the time created the Bank of North Dakota to serve North Dakotans, to help them with issues um, and gave us you know, the, the founding principles. Um, and I will tell you that the beginning of, of the history of the Bank of North Dakota was tumultuous to say the least. Um, there was a initiate, initiated measure almost immediately um, to halt the operations of the bank. There was a recall of the uh, entire industrial commission, which is made up of the governor, the attorney general, and the aid commissioner. That was successful. However, you know, the bank continued to survive because the people of North Dakota saw the benefit of a public bank, what it could do for the betterment of the state of North Dakota. 
Um, I, I can fast forward to really the 1960s is where the Bank of North Dakota first entered into um, the economic development and finance business. And that really is our primary emphasis today, although we still have a large ag uh, background. Um, uh, but primarily, we are all about diversifying our North Dakota economy. So I, I briefly touched on these founding principles, and I, 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 I want to mention uh, four of them, because I think they're important. Um, they're very important for the state of North Dakota. And I think as you think about these um, for your own you know, public banking uh, initiatives, these are something that you'd want to think about as well. And so these were written in 1919. So um, keep that in mind as you think about these. But the first one, and, and I, I can't tell you how important this one is, um, but is to fix in the minds of our citizens the exact purpose and scope of the bank's activities. So what are you trying to solve? What is not being done by the private sector that needs to be done to make, in our case, North Dakota better, in your case, your municipality better. I think that is just incredibly important that you bring your citizens along, that they understand what purpose it is that you are trying to serve. What are you trying to solve by doing this? And in our case, uh, they gave us our mission statement and, and we use it today. It's to encourage and promote agriculture, commerce, and industry. That's a large mission statement, which gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of where we want to go, what we want to do with this bank. The third uh, principle, and, and you know, I, I've heard a little bit of uh, backlash against you know the banking community. Understand it, uh, but for us, uh, in our mission principles. It states very clearly to be helpful and to assist in the development of financial institutions and public corporations within the state and not in any manner to destroy or to be harmful to existing financial institutions. And I'm gonna talk quite a bit about that uh, a little bit later. And then of course, the, the, the last one is to redeposit in the state uh, all the public funds. And I can tell you that all uh, North Dakota taxes, fees that are collected are all by law deposited at the Bank of North Dakota. So we, we uh, have a very large captive deposit base. And at, uh, at the uh, early days of the Bank of North Dakota, all municipal deposits were also legally be required uh, to be held at the bank. And through an initiated measure in the 30s, um, that was stopped and, and municipalities are free to deposit wherever they choose to. So let me, uh, let me continue on now with, with how, uh, how can public banks benefit government finance? I've heard that brought up before. Um, and in your case, how can that help uh, municipal government? And, and I could tell you uh, a number of ways that we do that in North Dakota. So we have a relationship with virtually every state agency and we meet with them periodically. We understand their cash flow needs. We provide uh, lines of credit to state agencies, making them, um, and they all have the authority to borrow from us. So it's not necessary for them to go to uh, state government to fund uh, certain critical issues. BND can do that without a, uh, a legislative uh, um, bill being passed. We provide funding for special state projects using uh, state general fund money to pay us back. So we will make loans for, and I can tell you right now, uh, you know, a couple of cases where we will fund uh, the housing incentive fund and uh, put money into the housing incentive fund. The legislature will come back in two years and pay us back for that investment. Uh, we provide market rate deposit relationships with state agencies, so they get a market rate on their deposit. So we're not, uh, you know, providing lower than market rates. They get exactly what the market dictates. 
Uh, also, we have a, a distribution of dividends. Now, I've heard others speak uh, earlier about you know, profits going back to shareholders. Um, I would have a different opinion than that. I think profits are important. Um, uh, in, in our case, certainly um, they are. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota uh, today is about a $10 billion bank. When I took over as president in 2000, we were about a $1.6 billion bank, earning 30 million a year. Uh, today we're earning over 170 million a year. At one point, uh, John Hoven, who was my predecessor, now is became governor and now is a senator. Um, um, they were taking uh, 30 million a year uh, in in a dividend to help fund general fund uh, expenditures, and we were at at one point the fifth or sixth largest revenue source back to the state. Now you know that. That's again, the bank of North Dakota in our relationship with the state. And it may be completely different from what you're thinking, but you know, I will tell you that, you know, profitability is important um, both from a regulator standpoint and, and also to fund growth. Um, unless you are continuing um, with capital draws and capital uh, uh, raises to bring money into your bank, you know, in our case, we raise capital through the retention of earnings. Uh, and today, a $10 billion bank, we have, uh, you know, a billion dollars of capital. That has all been done through retention of earnings. Um, and that has, in years past, um, acted as a, uh, a budget stabilization tool. When we've got in trouble, uh, financially, whether a uh, severe economic downturn, the state has turned to us and said, can we have a special dividend? And we just did that in 2015. We provided a special dividend of $100 million to the state to help balance our budgets. We also uh, use our, our, uh, our capital to develop programs that we don't want to carry on our balance sheet. These would be, you know, venture capital programs, uh, low rate disaster programs. Uh, David mentioned that, you know, in, in my tenure uh, at the bank, we've gone through many different uh, cycles of boom and bust, agriculture, energy. And as we've gone through it, uh, flooding also, we, we have provided uh, low rate disaster programs that we have taken those loans off of our balance sheet because they are so low that they would distort um, the bank's uh, ratios. But we, we, we do those, but we take them off balance sheet. We're also a big funder of housing incentive funds. So all of the issues that you talk about that I've heard, um, we've addressed over the years. We have, we have programs to address beginning startup, uh, beginning entrepreneur programs, we have venture capital programs. Uh, we have uh, programs that are meant to diversify uh, communities. Um, uh, we call it the PACE program. It's a partnership in um, uh, assisting community enhancement. And, and so we, we use the state um, buy down and we uh, match that with a local buy down and we buy the interest rate down on a loan to a business that is helping to diversify and create jobs. And we will reduce that uh, interest rate down from a market rate of say three or four down to one, for example. Um, you know, we are a bank that, um, you know, instead of backing away from a crisis, we run to the crisis. Um, because we believe that that is what makes us different. That is what makes the bank different from the private sector. Uh, you know, they have shareholders to protect. Um, we believe that it is our mission to help the state go forward. And sometimes that means you've got to jump into the crisis. You've got to be the firefighter going up the ladder, not running away. And so that, that's how I've always thought about the bank. And I know that's how uh, future leaders will think about the bank.
And I'm, I'm going to give you an example of that. Um, you know, they, they've talked a little bit about um, the uh, energy boom and bus cycles in North Dakota. Um, prior to 2008, North Dakota was the ninth or 10th uh, oil producer in the nation. Uh, you know, they discovered how to frack oil and, and I understand that, you know, um, I may be coming from a different viewpoint than you on fossil fuels, but it is an important part of our economy. Um, but we've gone through several uh, boom and bust cycles um, of oil, starting in the 50s, a second one in the 70s and 80s, and a third one, of course, now in 2008. But the, two, but the, uh, the one in 1970 and the bust in the early 80s uh, created havoc uh, in Western North Dakota. It, it happened, the bust happened so quickly. It left, uh, you know, cities uh, bankrupt. It left, you know, many empty buildings, storefronts, uh, cities with large debt obligations that it took years of restructuring to pay back. And so when the oil boom again started in 2008, 2009, what we saw was private sector banks absolutely scared to death of lending back into you know, the, the, this big boom cycle. They had been burned on real estate, they had been burned on housing projects, retail, um, um, you name it. Uh, it. It was a debacle. But we, you know, we recognized at the state and at the bank that this oil play uh, in 2008, 2009 was different. It was using different technology. Um, certainly the demand was there. And this thing then uh, vaulted the bank or the state of North Dakota from the eighth or ninth largest producer to the second, only behind Texas. Uh, and, and, you know, developing uh, somewhere around a million and a half barrels a day now I understand that New Mexico has uh, moved up to the second slot. North Dakota is number three. Uh, but anyway, you know what we found is that those banks that were so afraid to lend was holding back. You know the economic development of the region was holding back the development because there just simply wasn't housing, uh, and there wasn't uh, you know the financial institutions willing to come forward. And so, you know, I went up along with uh, other state officials, met with the banks, met with the city and said, how can we help? You know, th this is a time where we are being called on to do something special. We have an extraordinary event occurring in the state. We've got an extraordinary bank. Let's do something extraordinary. So that's what we did. We came in and we said, all right, we're gonna help you banks. We're gonna take a big chunk of that risk off of your balance sheet. We're gonna come in and participate in the loans that you make, but we will buy 80 to 90% of that loan. You get to keep the relationship with the borrower, you sell us the risk, we'll carry it. We did the same thing with a city of Williston that um, was really struggling issuing bonds. Their bond rating had just simply gone to hell because of uh, all the problems from 15, 20 years ago. So the Bank of North Dakota came in and provided a letter of credit to that bond issue, allowing them to sell bonds to do needed infrastructure that they would not have been able to do economically had we not used a letter of credit to, to dramatically drive down the price of that bond issue. So those, those are a couple of examples of how, um, you know, the, the Bank of North Dakota uh, was helpful. I do wanna talk a little bit about this, the approach that we have to lending. And that is, you know, a partnership approach versus a competitive approach with respect to the private sector financial institutions. And it's important for me to talk just a little bit about the structure of the bank. And this may be an interesting concept for you, but the Bank of North Dakota is really set up as a banker's bank. We have very few direct to consumer products with a few notable exceptions of 
student loans, ag real estate, and some bank stock loans. Th this approach really allows the continuation of the borrower relationship with their principal bank. And, and that bank then uses our, our special programs. I've mentioned a beginning entrepreneur program. I've mentioned the PACE program, the MATCH program. Uh, there's a myriad of, of programs that we have that touches each part of our economy. And so those banks originate the deal. They use the Bank of North Dakota. Um, we come in, we participate with them in the loan. The borrower um, continues to work with their local lender. Um, but the, the big benefit, of course, in all of this is leverage. So small banks, and, and, and I will tell you that the Bank of North Dakota, I think has been a uh, caveat or uh, uh, the, the panacea probably is a better word in helping with the continuation of a very strong community banking system. Uh, those small banks, and, and you know, they range in size from you know, 100 million to you know, the Wells Fargo's are here. But the smaller banks are able to operate at a, at a size of the Bank of North Dakota. They can make a loan to a borrower where they might have a lending limit, a legal lending limit of $5 million. They can use our lending capacity, which is upwards of 150 million, and combine those to uh, assist their borrower and keep their borrower, instead of them having to leave and go to the next bigger bank, go to the Wells, go to the JP Morgans, they can keep them because uh, they have uh, the size and capacity with the bank. And so that leads to a very healthy uh, banking environment in the state. Um, and, and we believe that has been really uh, one of the most important things that we've done at, at the Bank of North Dakota is to continue to facilitate and strengthen those ties between those you know, community banks and the Bank of North Dakota. It's, it's a win-win. We get to use their documentation. Uh, they keep the relationship. Um, all of the uh, loans that we do are tied together under a master participation agreement. Uh, so it's simple. We use technology uh, uh, as best we can to, to make the transactions as smooth as possible. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it really is, uh, I think, the, uh, the thing that ties it all together. And of course, we're active. We are out there. Um, we have bankers in the field calling on our banking customers, uh, trying to identify problems and opportunities. They come back to the bank and say, this, this is what I'm hearing. These are the problems. These are the opportunities. And, and we do something about it. I think that's what makes us different is that we're not waiting for somebody to tell us what to do. We're out there, you know, digging up, uh, lifting up the rocks. Where can we help? Um, and that, that's really how we, we, we think about things. How can we help the state be better? Um, you know, our, our relationship with the banks goes beyond just lending. Uh, we provide monthly education programs. And I, I can talk a little bit how we help with the PPP program. Newsletters, a very progressive website. Um, you know, uh, North Dakota got a lot of credit uh, on the PPP program. That, uh, you know, on a per capita basis, we were out quicker, got more money out in the field. Uh, uh, per capita than anybody else. And um, the Bank of North Dakota was credited with, with helping. And I, I can tell you that we never made one PPP loan. Um, but what we did is because of our relationship with the banks, we were able to successfully bring together the banking community with the federal agencies delivering PPP. And the, the federal government figured out something that we have known for decades. And that is if you wanna get money out into the field, use the banking system. 
It's quick. They know what they're doing. They know their customers. And we've been doing it for 100 years. Um, and so we were able to link um, those banks through a, uh, a monthly education process that we've been doing for years. And we simply got SBA, FEMA, and all of the banks you know, on the same page very quickly. We had upwards of 600 uh, participants in these calls. Um, and so we, we, uh, we quickly, uh, North Dakota quickly came to the forefront. And, and I will just tell you that, you know, as we looked at, uh, you know, the COVID response uh, from the federal government, we at the bank actually were criticized a little bit in that we didn't come out with a program prior to PPP, because typically we have, we've come out with disaster programs to help. But it has been my experience and our experience that when these types of disasters happen, um, and of course, nobody had ever seen anything like, you know, this COVID issue, but we in the state have seen, you know, disasters come and go, whether they're flooding in Minot, Fargo, um, ag disasters. So we, we had a blueprint on how this should work. And what we did is we sat back and said, where are the gaps? Who's missing out on PPP? You know, where, what businesses are not being uh, advantaged by the PPP? Um, and so we, we, we took our time, we went back out to the businesses and said, okay, here's the PPP program. What are you not getting? And they said, well, this is all great. This is all money to help us bring back our employees, but we need money for working capital going forward. So the Bank of North Dakota uh, drafted its own program that was meant to supplement PPP, not replace it. We find no uh, interest in doing any of that. Why would we replace or compete with federal government programs? That, that makes no sense. Their pockets are bigger, deeper. Um, and when you looked at PPP, uh, there was the ability to, uh, you know, forgive the loans. Um, David, am I running out of time? You're at time, Eric. Uh, but but if so, I, I know you've got a lot to say. Uh, but we've also got uh, uh, questions from both panelists and the audience. Yeah. Well. Um, why don't I just, you know, call it good there. I've, I've touched on a lot of the things uh, that I was asked to, I will, I will say one more thing about, uh, I was asked to talk about student loans and I'll just make a, a quick little pitch there. Um, the, the bank of North Dakota was actually the first bank in the nation to make a federally subsidized student loan. We did that in 1967. So we've been in the student loan business longer than anybody. Uh, we were the first bank to do a total refinance of all student loans. We beat SoFi to that. So in North Dakota, if you are a North Dakota resident, you can package all of your student loan debt under one loan that the Bank of North Dakota will make at lower than market driven uh, rates. So, it's a great retention tool. It's it's a it's a great thing for our North Dakotans. And when COVID came uh, along, student loan borrowers were hurting. We lowered the interest rate even further for them. So you know we, we just have a lot of ability to make a difference every day for our uh, North Dakotans. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. And, and and I think folks, for like what I, my takeaway here is that all the rhetoric that we in the California Public Banking Alliance have been moving about the benefits of democratizing finance and having a public bank, Eric is demonstrating that it's work, that it's true. It literally works. So folks, what we're gonna do now is open up for 10 minutes uh, to our panelists. We've got like some real powerhouse elected officials here. So I'm just gonna open uh, your mics and, and ask if any of you as elected officials uh, have a question, if you could try to be concise, uh, but we're going to open it up for 10 minutes for just a discussion uh, between y'all uh, and Eric.
I have a quick uh, question, Eric. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, have done provided any seed money to worker owned co-ops, anything like that to get worker co-ops off the ground there. They're very popular out here, or at least we're trying to make them uh, more popular. A lot of people are interested. Well, I'm not sure I really understand worker uh, cooperative, but I can tell you that back in the 90s, we had what was called co-op fever sweep the state of North Dakota. Oh. So we had uh, co-ops starting up to do just about everything. We, we had, uh, you know, Durham growers getting together to make pasta. We had carrot growers. We had lamb producers. We had, uh, yeah, co-ops uh, starting up for for everything we, we, we saw, they saw the benefit of value add. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that really became, uh, you know, as I said, kind of swept the state in a thing called co-op fever. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have worked with that um, type of, uh, you know, uh, movement before. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure when you say worker co-op, mm -hmm. uh, what exactly you're... So uh, Eric, if specifically worker-owned cooperatives as opposed to consumer co-op or agricultural co-ops, uh, uh, Gail and I work together on this on this front, so uh, I know I know I see her by her smile too. Really, we worker-owned cooperative businesses, which are still businesses that have to return a profit, but they're worker-owned. Yeah, well, we do a lot of work with ESOPs. Um, and so there's a lot of businesses that become ESOP. Um, we do a tremendous amount of work there too. Thank you. And, and I see we have council member Justin Cummings and then council member Curran Price. Well, Eric, first, I just wanna thank you um, for your presentation and for being here tonight. This has been uh, really illuminating in terms of you know, what opportunities are available for us, especially as it relates to public banking. Based on kind of the kind of what I've been hearing, you know, it's like North Dakota, it's like the North Dakota Public Bank, for example, right? And so I guess my question is, you know, here in the state of California, and based on, you know, the people who are here, there are various regions that are moving forward with their own public banks. And I'm curious, um, in terms of approach, uh, the benefits or or you know the the contrast between the state of California moving forward with regional public banks versus us all coming together the the regions as a whole who are interested in public banking for us all to have one cohesive public bank and what the trade offs might be in doing that and then I'm just and then the, the follow up question is also how do you deal with competing needs understanding that um, you know at a state level. You know whether it's a larger city or rural communities, there are different needs that um, the banks can help serve, and how do you balance those? So, yeah, the two questions are like, you know, is it yeah. better for us to all kind of work together and create our own like larger bank, or versus the smaller regional banks, and and then like how do you deal with the the needs um, of the various communities at larger and smaller scales? Yeah, as I think about California and understanding your economy and, and how diverse it is to begin with um, and how large it is and populated it is, um, you know, the, the one thing that strikes me is that, you know, a state-owned bank works in North Dakota because of relatively small size, homogenous uh, needs. Whereas in California, things are incredibly diverse and at a scale that is, is even hard for me to imagine. So, you know, there's never a one size fits all. And, and I, I quite honestly think the approach that you're going down uh, with, you know, municipal owned uh, is, is smart. Um, because I, I think, uh, you know, the. Uh, as I said, California has just, you know, everything happens first in California. Um, and you have such, you know, diversification there that it would be impossible, you know, to, to, to 
to have, I think, one bank size fits all. I can't imagine the scale of the size of the bank you would need to fund all of the uh, uh, initiatives that you would need in North Dakota. So to me, breaking it down and, and using it on a municipal level where you can get to the local needs much quicker and understand them much better. They're unique to each area in, in California. So um, yeah, I, I think the, the, that approach makes, you know, tremendous amount of sense to me. Council Member Price. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I, I'm just I'm just so impressed with the uh, with the presentations uh, and the commitment that everyone is making. And it occurred to me there are two other functions that uh, that we're doing in LA that certainly I think would be uh, consistent with uh, public banking or or a potential product in the public bank. We have something called the Angelino Card uh, that is distributed to uh, uh, individuals in need. Uh, monies from uh, philanthropic uh, contributions or maybe some city money in it. Right now, that's issued by a, 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 public, a private bank. That's a function that could be certainly a public banking uh, institution with less fees, less red tape, uh, and as some have suggested, getting those dollars into the hands of, of the community in ways we haven't before. You know, we've also recently established a children's savings account. So many municipalities are doing that. We're excited about the, the prospects of, of, of that kind of a of program. And again, right now we're just doing it in conjunction with a with a, a public bank, with a, a private bank, you know, where these funds are held. Uh, and, but again, that could be a public banking function, a public banking product uh, that uh, that would be that be be relevant. And again, providing more resources for those who they are intended. So. I just think the opportunities are endless. Opportunities are exciting. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this discussion. I've enjoyed and appreciated the comments made. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to joining you as we move forward individually in our cities, not just here in LA, not, not just in California, I should say, but nationally as well. So I'm excited to be a part of this process. Thank you. I would just say that, you know, along with everything that I've described about the bank, the other thing that we do is we do administer the state's 529 savings plan. And uh, not only for college students, but for um, parochial school. And, and what we do is we provide every newborn with a grant uh, as long as their parents match it. Um, so every newborn in the state gets a grant to help them get started on their way uh, either through uh, K-12 or through, uh, you know, uh, college university programs. So, um, yeah, we, we believe education is fundamental to economic development. Thank you. Uh, so folks, what we're gonna do now is, uh, and I wanna remind you, please continue to ask questions in the chat. Uh, uh, we're going to make sure that we follow up with every single question that we get uh, with a reply to the email that you registered to if we're not able to get to it uh, uh, on this forum. So please do know that every question uh, we're going to address to the very best of, my, uh, of our collective ability at the California Public Banking Alliance. Uh, Eric, uh, Mark Armstrong asked, Please talk about the organizing role that the Bank of North Dakota plays in the North Dakota economy. You mentioned the fact that uh, North Dakota had the highest average paycheck protection plan amount uh, per worker uh, than any other state in the union. Uh, so what is it about the Bank of North Dakota that helps organize and progressively or uh, uh, popularly uh, engage the North, North Dakota state economy like that? Sure. Well, I saw that comment from Mark. Uh, I've known him for years. Um, you know, early on in, I would say, uh, early 90s, the Bank of North Dakota organized what's called the One Stop Capital Center. And that is, you know, we understand that people have great ideas. Uh, they don't know where to go with them. They don't know, you know, what is the next step? How do I take my idea from an idea to a product. Um, and so we have worked really hard to bring agencies together under a one-stop capital um, methodology where a, a, a 
person with an idea can come in and uh, figure out what the fine what what should be the best path for them to go on in terms of developing this, how to finance this particular product, what are the agencies, what are the steps to go from soup to nuts. So how do I take my idea? How do I get venture capital in it? How do I then graduate to bank debt? Um, and what are all of the gaps within that that we can that we can um, develop? And we, you know we we've developed a number of those types of programs that fit you know the gaps, and we've tried to eliminate as many redundant uh, programs as possible along the way. So we're always trying to be as efficient as possible, eliminate the, the uh, duplications and fill in the gaps. And we do that with strong relationships with uh, you know, economic development entities, with the universities, um, research centers, um, um, you know, everyone we can think of, uh, chambers of commerce uh, uh, are all engaged in this activity. And, and again, you know, we get to do this because we're a small state. Um, and that's why I like your idea of breaking this down into smaller bites in California. Well, Eric, that really leads us into the next question. And Steve asked it, and that is what kind of presence do the big national banks have in North Dakota? And how, uh, how are you relating to that? Well, yeah, so you know, the big banks would be the Wells Fargo's. Um, they are, you know, the, the largest uh, bank here. JP Morgan, I think, just opened up a shop in Fargo. Um, you know, I, I don't like bashing any bank. Um, but, you know, I, I can tell you that, you know, my experience has been the smaller community banks are uh, bigger risk takers. Uh, they are more likely to see their community for what it is and want to work to help the community prosper. Um, you know, taking risk, uh, financing people that they, you know, know every day, they go to church with, they go out to dinner with. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, you don't see that from a Wells. Um, you don't see that from a J.P. Morgan. You know, they're more concerned about their pristine uh, credit quality than um, necessarily helping their customer. And I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of feedback on that, but I, that, that's, been, <laughs> that's, that's been my experience. Uh, well, yeah, Eric, thank you for being such a straight shooter. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge, your experience, and participating. I also want to thank all of the other panelists, and I want to thank the hundred and over 170 people who joined us on Zoom tonight. I want to thank the hundreds of others who watched us live on Facebook. And I want to thank the thousands of you I know who are going to watch this recording over time. Uh, we've come to the end and we at the California Public Banking Alliance really try to be disciplined uh, about uh, what we're offering and what we're asking of others. I'm going to end with this. There were a lot of questions asked. Again, I promise that we are going to follow up in email with each and every one of you who asked a question. And I'm also gonna end with an invitation and a loving, respectful challenge to you that if you're not involved in a local public banking movement in California, there are public banking uh, efforts all across the state. And frankly, if there's not one in your community, I will personally work with you to help you create one uh, because we can do it, but we can only do it together. Good night, y'all.